afternoon, uh, good morning uh, from wherever you're joining us from. Uh, in this chair, chilly afternoon, um, we are broadcasting uh, live from Nairobi and we're joined by people uh, from Kenya and uh, other East African nations and elsewhere uh, in, in the world. Uh, welcome very much. Uh, this is a webinar uh, organized by Internews Earth Journalism Network in partnership uh, with NRT or the Northern Regional Earth Trust uh, who support uh, community conservancies in the Northern Kenya and in Mombasa and in Northern Coast. Uh, so we'll be hearing this uh, more uh, from our panelists uh, today. Uh, and before uh, we, we go to that, uh, we'll have a few you know, house rules. As you join in, you're on mute and uh, uh, you're not on video, but, but we really want this to be interactive. Uh, so you can ask questions as our panelists uh, tell their story and uh, later uh, we'll go into a Q&A. So uh, dear colleagues from wherever you joined us from, uh, you can see from the bottom of the screen, we have a Q&A and we have a, a chat. Uh, please don't use the chat icon, use the Q&A. Put your question there, tell us where you are, uh, tell us who you work with, and also uh, direct your question to any uh, of the panelists that you'd like uh, to ask uh, the question from. Uh, again, uh, we're broadcasting from Nairobi, uh, the Earth Journalism Network uh, for Internews, a project of Internews which supports uh, journalists all over the world. Uh, in East Africa, we have a project on uh, training journalists, uh, giving them story grants to be able to go do stories in places that they are not able to. And uh, this is to just improve their storytelling on conservation and wildlife and also on things to do with the environment. And this uh, particular webinar, uh, we're glad to have the Northern Regions Trust uh, with support from USAID uh, to tell the story of community conservancies, which is a model uh, that uh, is, uh, is being practiced uh, in Kenya and historically from Northern Regions Trust, uh, but which uh, we'd like uh, our colleagues in the media to understand and also other people, the stakeholders uh, who have uh, joined us. And for this, uh, we have a rich panelist uh, of people who actually were born here, most of them. Uh, they live here in these communities and mostly in the Northern Kenya, that's areas of Samburu, uh, like Kipia. And they're able to tell us their story and to also you know, tell us what is a community conservancy, its history, and its benefits. Uh, so kindly, again, ask your questions on the icon uh, below there. And right now, I'll introduce our, our first speaker. Uh, we have a panel of four uh, very able people, uh, starting with uh, Daniel Letoya, and then we'll have Tom uh, Lolosoli, and then we'll have Nicole uh, Lengima and Tom Letiwa, and the, and Tom Latiwa will be the last one before we go to the Q&A. But I'll be uh, reading their bios as we uh, invite them to speak. Uh, I, I think I've bought enough time uh, to have people joining us and I'm seeing they're joining us. And now I uh, will start with you, Daniel Letoye. Uh, if you could allow me to introduce you uh, uh, and your topic, uh, you'll be talking about or giving us a historical background of the Northern Kenya at the Northern Rangelands uh, Trust, that's NRT and the Community Conservancy Model, uh, you know, just give us a history of where it's coming from, what it is, and the benefits it has to, you know, these diverse uh, communities of the Northern Kenya. Uh, Daniel is the NRT Conservancy's a Sustainability Director. He supports the implementation of the Conservancy Sustainability Plans and set out a strategy for achieving and maintaining this growth. He's a passionate conservationist inspired by his early interaction with wildlife while growing up in the Northern Kenya highlands of Samburu. He's the founding member of Westgate Conservancy in Northern Kenya, which he has managed for eight years. In May 2013, uh, Daniel was awarded uh, the prestigious Whitley Award, otherwise uh, known in jest as the Green Oscars uh, by her Royalness High Princess Anne at the Royal Geographical Society of London. Uh, the, uh, the award was in recognition, recognition of his outstanding conservation leaders, leadership and exemplary performance in conservation of the uh, widely uh, endangered gravy zebra uh, in those uh, sides of Samburu. Uh, Daniel, please uh, 
the floor is yours. When you are ready, you can share your presentation. Um, uh, thank you so much. Hi, everyone. Um, as you all heard about uh, myself, uh, yeah, um, I, it's actually my pleasure to be here to give you uh, some few hint, hints uh, about, about uh, what we do as Northern Ranger and Trust. And um, feel free to ask any question you feel like. If, if, if there is anything of interest that you uh, you are interested with, please feel free and, you know, um, whether I've touched it or not, uh, or anything even outside what I've spoken, feel free to ask uh, as, as we move forward. Otherwise, with that, I will, I will do a, a very short presentation uh, on, on, um, on what, you know, what we do as Northern Ranger and Trust. Um, Yeah, so uh, as you heard, I work, I work with the Northern Ranger and Trust as a, as a director of uh, conservancy sustainability. And let me start uh, first by, you know, just uh, giving you a background of the organization. As you may have read somewhere that this organization was uh, uh, established in 2004, and our mission is actually to develop uh, resilience uh, conservancies and transform uh, people's livelihood, and also uh, deal with peace and conserve natural resources. The model actually, uh, the values or what, what guide us in what we do is about the resilience. Uh, communities strong, independent and sustainable. You know, where communities can also be to have genuine community-led decision-making. Uh, you know, strong community ownership where communities are able to own their resources, you know, without necessarily being uh, you know, guided or, you know, um, led by any uh, outsider. So it's, it's their own resources. And also the rights, benefits, uh, and responsibilities. And this can happen through uh, the right governance, governance system, where you will see in my, shortly in my presentation, uh, peace and security, uh, where, you know, they're doing a lot of their peace and security activities on their own, you know, livelihood and economic development and definitely, the, again, the sustainable natural resource management in their own land. So, you know, those are some of the key uh, principles or values that guide us as an organization. I hope I'm not so fast and, and, and that because I know I only have um, 10 minutes. So I want to ensure that, uh, you know, I cover all my presentation, which is, which is actually very brief. Uh, the map you see there is, is the map of, uh, you know, Northern Rangeland Trust where you know, where we operate in Kenya. And uh, the small one you see here is, uh, as, as, as Kiundu mentioned, we operate in Northern Kenya and uh, Northern part of uh, the coastal area, that is Lamu. And we also operate in uh, uh, North Rift where we have about uh, three conservancy or four conservancies in Baringo. And, uh, and you can see uh, you know, the color of, uh, you know, the two conservancies in the North Rift, but our bigger chunk is concentrated around like Kipia, Isiolo, and, uh, and, and Samburu. So that is, uh, that's where we are, but, uh, you know, that we have also our conservancies uh, in the coast around the Lamu uh, region. Our theory of change is actually driven by the challenges that, uh, you know, that have been facing the Northern Kenya region. Uh, all of us across the world, we understand that northern part of Kenya is known by insecurity, where there is, you know, poverty, social exclus exclusion, you know, where, you know, people have not gone to school, people are, you know, the gender issues and, and all the breakdown of the uh, traditional governance systems, you know, uh, population growth, uh, depletion of natural resources, uh, you know, from what, what is happening, you know, things like a range of, uh, degradation, wildlife poaching. Uh, the issue of climate change is also uh, a bigger challenge, which is now a cross-cutting issue in the whole, uh, the whole world. And, and, and with that, we thought as an organization, there is a need for us to, to think of the new approach. Uh, and, and this approach, we thought of, uh, you know, land management, conservation and development, you know, link of the, the three. 
And actually our approach or, or our key areas of focus, as you can see in the NRT, uh, you know, our key areas of focus is uh, governance, peace and security, livelihood and business, and natural resources. And, you know, you can, as you read all these, you can be able to see uh, what all that is. Um, again, um, you know, uh, so that is what, 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 what drives us as our theory of change as NRT. And uh, we are looking at, uh, you know, uh, achieving uh, resilience communities at, at the end of it. Um, yeah, our areas of focus, as I said earlier, is that uh, we need to have uh, improved uh, governance and inclusion uh, in the communities, security, peace, and stability, improve our rural infrastructure. Uh, when we talk of rural infrastructure, we are talking of, uh, you know, schools, roads, airstrip, uh, then uh, things like, you know, the other one is improved range and management. And this is because our wildlife and also our, our livestock, because most of these communities are pastoral communities, they depend on this range run. So the, the health of our range run is actually a critical uh, component. Then conservation of biodiversity and, and, uh, and wildlife assets is, is a key focus uh, in our work. Livelihood diverse, diversification uh, and value chain support skills uh, you know, value chain support where, you know, we support uh, skills development, employment, access to financial services, uh, you know, things like microcredit, uh, where we are formed as an organization, what we call NRT trading. NRT trading is the business arm of NRT and uh, the ones now looking at um, uh, livelihood diversification and looking at the business uh, part of it and provide the financial services for the communities. Looking at the NRT impact for the last few years, uh, this is just um, a chart showing our impact or our results. Uh, in 2018, you can see the rest of the years, but I just decided to use the 2018 one. You know, you can look at um, the, the Kenya, 86 uh, million Kenya shillings that actually came from, uh, from the tourism, and it actually went to these communities. And um, uh, you look at this, this has actually been increasing over over time you know like for 2017 2018 it was about 31% increase you know it, things like uh, you know uh, render and clearing well, for 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 receiving purposes those kind of actors 885 you know this is a degraded land you know things like uh, you know elephant poaching has really gone down almost to, to like uh, 2018 we were only able to record uh, three elephant poached in, in in the whole region so this is really a big, um, you know, a big uh, impact that we can be able to at, uh, uh, articulate to, uh, to what we are doing. Uh, looking at, for example, again on uh, 2019, uh, and this information is available uh, in our website. So uh, these are just some few figures that I was able to, to, uh, to put them up. So if you look at uh, what is happening, you know, as, as, as Yundu mentioned, things like gravy zebra population has really been uh, stabilized for the last few years. Uh, Hirola numbers have actually increased by, for example, uh, Hirola numbers have increased by 160%. You know, things like um, the students supported by Basari. Uh, 2019, our, our revenue has really gone up in terms of the tourism up to uh, three, uh, two million, I mean, three million US dollars. And if you look at the numbers, uh, you can see the number of people that are actually benefiting from for, from this conservancy. Um, something I just want to take you a little bit back to the map. Uh, I, 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 as I mentioned that, um, you know, NRT, we are supporting or we are working with 39 conservancies uh, cutting across 10, uh, 10 uh, counties in Kenya and covering about uh, 42 million um, square kilometers. So that's, that's, that is how big we are and where we are. Uh, in terms of, uh, in terms of uh, you know, at the conservancy level, what we actually do is that uh, we build the governance capacity of, of the communities leadership uh, and management training you know things uh, those are the things we do creating a platform uh, for focus and development of talent in the wildlife sector you know looking at uh, you know the talents at the local level 
nature-based economic growth, you know, things like uh, bid work, uh, things like, uh, you know, livestock for, for, for markets, uh, and also support the, the rangeland uh, management, as I said, about the receding and, and, and acacia revision clearing, which is an invasive species that kill uh, all our rangelands. Um, at the national level, uh, we also uh, have a critical role, and one of our key uh, approach is to work with the Kenya Wildlife Service and also the newly established uh, 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 KWCA, uh, Kenya Wildlife Conservancy Association, where we are working with them to ensure that we are feasible or we are working with them in issues of um, you know, uh, translocation of wildlife, public-private partnership based on wildlife, uh, managing human wildlife conflict in terms of, you know, implementing the Wildlife Act, uh, strengthening community conservation authority relationships, you know, just to ensure that, uh, you know, at the local level, we, we, we link it at the national level, provide international uh, best practice input in local uh, conservation bodies, you know, um, uh, and also inform progressive and innovative funding for conservation models. You know, like, you know, in, in, in Northern Kenya, uh, the conservancy model, as you can see, you know, it's, it's, it's an innovative model, model where uh, the communities are able to manage wildlife in their own area or in their lo own local land. Uh, you know, in our country, Kenya, we have only, uh, actually we have a more than, seven, I mean, about 70% of our wildlife uh, uh, outside of uh, formal government protected area. So that is the innovation we are talking about uh, protecting or conserving this wildlife that exists. In the, in, the, in the wildlife, um, I mean, outside the protected areas. Looking at the sustainability, how do we look at the sustainability of our fisher, uh, of the fisher plan of our model? You know, we look at uh, having well-governed community-led institutions that represent the voice of the communities. That is our key uh, our plan. Then look at uh, effective partnership, invest uh, uh, relations where, you know, we, we, we work with the conservancies or with the communities to ensure that they have effective partnership with the investors, people who are investing in tourism, in, in, in other businesses within their own land. Uh, then build human capacity and resilience. You know, as, as I said about you know, the trainings we provide to ensure that the communities, the local communities, whether going to school or not, they, are, they have their capa the capacity to manage their own resources. Then the other key component is about the diversification of revenue streams, where you know um, they have, uh, like right now at the issue of uh, COVID-19, you know tourism is uh, has really gone down, and you know that it have impacted a lot of a lot of tourism activities. So they need to diversify things like uh, bid work, things like livestock, things like uh, other natural resource business related uh, products can be. Um, engage in as business. Uh, then uh, to recreate a resilient ecosystem. If the ecosystem is resilient and they can be able to have rich and healthy rangelands, then this, this definitely make their life easier with, together with the wildlife as well. Then the other issue is about the attitude change, where people need to see wildlife as a major economic asset than feeling them as, as a threat. Uh, and then definitely the future uh, political re relevance, where the government, both levels of the government, you know, the county government and the national government can be able to have, um, you know, conservants can have a, a political relevance at, at all levels. So that is, that is what we are looking at, uh, uh, at, at, at the, as the future of the model. Uh, the, in terms of uh, the impact of COVID-19, I can actually say that, uh, you know, because of the tourism income and the jobs, you know, this has actually rendered these communities into higher levels of poverty. And with this, also you see, you know, uh, there are big parts of this, these communities that depend on, uh, uh, on, on aid services, and this has really been interfered with, uh, you know, interrupted because, you know, the way these this services uh, reach to the, these communities is, is, has already been interfered. The government uh, services redirected now into different uh, places as opposed to what was happening. Market access, you know, during this COVID-19, uh, the market, the livestock market were closed and these communities entirely depend on this. So just imagine these communities were depending on livestock and depending on tourism and all this is now closed. So the question is, what, is, what, is, what, what are they depending on? So you can just imagine how the situation is. Uh, then, uh, as I said, the conservancies provide essential services to deliver critical services to uh, 
a household through this period, you know, the conservancies are now working out to try to see other modalities, which I'm sure Tom uh, Letua and Tom Loloseli will be able to mention in their presentation and what, what, what they are doing as conservancies to deliver these services to, to the household. So those are some of the impacts I can say about, uh, you know, on, uh, uh, on, on the COVID-19. And um, yeah, so um, thank you so much. And uh, yeah, I hope I hope I manage my time, Duncan or Kiundu, and uh, maybe I'm happy to have your questions. Uh, yeah, as you come. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you so much, uh, Bona Daniel. Uh, that was a really good presentation that has given a background uh, of the community conservancies uh, through the NRT case. Uh, Yes, we'll be asking questions. Uh, I can see uh, people who join us from all over. And please, uh, if you have a question for Daniel, uh, uh, again, go to the icons uh, below there. You'll see there is a Q&A and there is a chat. Uh, please put your questions on the chat. Tell us who you are, where you joining us from, and your question you directed to a particular speaker uh, for today. And you've just joined us. Uh, this is the Internews Earth Journalism Network uh, webinar in partnership with Northern Range Runs uh, Trust, uh, who empower communities through conservation. And our, our webinar today is looking into investing in these communities uh, to conserve the wildlife. And of course, the case of Northern Kenya and uh, looking into how this also merges uh, with the tourism and the impact that has been there today or now uh, because of the pandemic that we are all going through. Uh, so we'll be able to hear this and, and Daniel has uh, mentioned a few. And now we'll go to our second speaker, uh, who is Tom Lolosoli. Uh, he's the manager at Kalama Community Conservancy. Uh, he'll be telling us uh, his, about his work, working with communities. Uh, this is the elders, the youth, and the women, and Morans uh, in that area of Samburu, you know, like Ipia. And uh, we'll also highlight the innovations uh, that uh, uh, they, they have implemented or they're using now uh, to, to just uh, react or to fight the resilience at COVID-19, as Daniel mentioned. Uh, so Tom uh, again works with the community members in efforts to securing their wild spaces through conservation, wildlife monitoring, and creating awareness in the community in order to mitigate human wildlife conflict. He works closely with women and Morans in maximizing livelihoods, opportunities like bead making and livestock uh, markets, and engaging in clearing of invasive species uh, which threaten uh, the range lands trust. And now I am going to share uh, his presentation, and he will, and he will go ahead uh, with it. Uh, so Tom, uh, there it is. Uh, kindly, uh, are you able to see that? Uh, kindly unmute yourself. Yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, yes. yes, please. You're much welcome. Let me know when I can move to the next slide. Okay, thank you. The stage is uh, yours. Thank you so much. Well, my name is I'm Tom Lolosoli, uh, manager uh, Kalama Community uh, Wildlife Conservancy, and I'm very happy to be part of this uh, Internews NRT webinar update uh, for today. That is Monday, 20, uh, July of 2020. Uh, we can go to the next slide. Kiundu. Uh, as you can see, uh, that is the map of Gilgir Group Ranch uh, that Kalama Conservancy is part of. Uh, Kalama Conservancy is 16,000 hectares inside uh, 49,800 hectares of uh, Grigiri Group Ranch owned by the local communities. Uh, it's actually uh, very symbolic uh, because uh, Kalama Conservancy happens to have no habitation inside uh, of people, no settlement inside. Uh, as you can see, the distribution of settlements, uh, the red dot, they are outside the conservancy area. 
And that has made it uh, very possible for Kalama uh, to be a very successful conservancy. Uh, and we have tried always to engage communities uh, to create ownership, uh, controlling uh, cattle encroachment, community uh, to instill the ownership. And that is why uh, we have been given uh, that space uh, since the beginning uh, to be able to undertake uh, the conservation initiatives uh, that we are doing. Next slide. Is it that one? Um, yeah, the, the theme of what I'm going to present is uh, working with communities that is the elders, youth, women, and Morans in conservation and I like innovations in terms of COVID-19. Next. Um, our tagline um, is a resilient uh, community land use policy for conservation that uplifts uh, livelihood. Next. I'm going to begin uh, by highlighting the in improving governance, uh, community outreach uh, and training. Uh, by this, I'll try to emphasize uh, the need uh, to engage board to improve their capacity because they're the representatives of community as uh, uh, governors or directors uh, of the conservancy. Um, the conservancy over technical support uh, to board and enhance the community outreach programs for inclusivity and upholding community support and ownership. Also the board and staff capacity building was achieved by attending a complete four modules of leadership and management program uh, training. This also included grazing committee, uh, community women and Morans that underwent a custom three phase modules uh, courtesy of NLP. It improves rationality and decision making. Uh, also structured uh, communication uh, through information sharing and community sensitization like annual audits and conservancy progress report uh, during AGMs. Also using of social media uh, to disseminate information and uh, the zonal community uh, outreaches. Uh, also board elections every three years and a maximum term of two for a sitting board member improved governance, giving other community members opportunity to serve and dispensing new energy, ideas and experience. Support of livelihood programs is always guaranteed and very key. Uh, also through community engagements, we, uh, the conservancy improved security, peace and harmony among uh, neighboring communities. And this has been realized through peace building initiatives, bringing together neighboring communities in dialogue uh, meetings and youth sports, also promoting microcredit projects. Exposure tours to community elders, Morans and women to benchmark conventions management in right trust in Boringo in order to acquire knowledge in community management, uh, uh, com community managed grass banks and developing economic opportunities has been life transform transformative as our communities are almost engaging in grass ventures. You can see the photos below. Uh, there's board and staff leadership and the management training program. Next slide, Kyundu. You can see that? Uh, yes, yes. Yeah. yeah, you can see that. Figure number one, you can see a uh, board and staff leadership and management training program. And uh, figure number two, also uh, you can see annual general meeting uh, elections every three years. New board members paraded uh, before members. Also still during this uh, AGM, we normally uh, present annual audit and uh, conservancy progress reports. Figure number four, you can see right trust of which was lecturing the team on principles of good wetland and grazing management, storage of grass seeds, synchronous ciliaries, and Maasai love grass. 
So our people have been engaged, taken for exposure tours, and they are now trying to apply uh, the knowledge acquired in man managing uh, the wetlands. And also you see every three years we do annual, uh, uh, we do elections in our AGMs and uh, board member is supposed to sit for a maximum of two terms of which each term is two years. And uh, during AGMs we present audits, uh, reports and uh, progress reports. Uh, to elaborate more on this, uh, we'll normally call board members uh, to conserve the headquarters and distribute to them hard copies of audits, reports, and uh, progress. I think we're losing Tom. Hello, Tom, can you hear me? Hello. Uh, as we try to raise him. Uh, hello, Tom. I think we've lost him. Uh, Daniel, can I come back to you? That is fine. As I try to raise uh, Tom, uh, there is a question for you. I think has he dropped off? Uh, let me see. Hello. Yes, I I can hear you. Yes, I think Tom has dropped off, unfortunately. Uh, so we try to get him back. So there is a question for you uh, from Peter Muirori, who works with the Standard here in Kenya, and he's asking that conservation in Northern Kenya conservancy is is seen as a white man driven concept. What are you doing to debunk this myth? How can you earn more trust from local communities, especially balancing their daily needs with the long-term conserv conservation goals? Please. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Peter, for your question. And um, yeah, that is very true. I agree with you. It has always been uh, felt that uh, it is, it is um, a white man-driven concept. But I want to say uh, with a lot of confidence that yes, um, however much people think of that, but that's not really the case. And this always comes from people who, who are actually not within, within the, the communities. If you go to the communities themselves, you can actually see, uh, you know, or you can hear from them that uh, it, the conservancies are not a uh, white man uh, concept. And uh, one of the things that I know that uh, it, it, you know, people need to change because of this is that, um, you know, there is, there is a complete difference between the community conservancies and, 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 and the private conservancies, which is, uh, which is the feeling, you know, uh, uh, which still relates to your question, number two. So, um, you know, so the way, we are, the way we work with the communities as, as NRT is that, um, uh, you know, the conservancies are not national parks. The conservancies are not you know, protected areas. The conservancies are areas that are being utilized by the communities with, on their own daily activities. You know, they are, they are not excluded from their land. They use their land, they plan how to use their land, including livestock grazing, including settlement, including schools. So if, if the communities are able to plan their land and use their land the way they want for their own benefit, then this definitely uh, will change the, the myth that it's not, I mean, it, that it's not a, a white man uh, driven agenda. So, and, and also the, you know, the, their livelihood activities, the way that it benefits, they are managing their own resources. It's about them owning their own resources. It's not about somebody else owning the resources on their behalf like the livestock that is there, the, the, the wildlife that is there, it is them owning together with the government of Kenya. So it's completely different from, uh, from the private uh, conservancies or the private ranches, particularly maybe in like Kipia and Naivasha areas. Um, again, on your question number two about the fees prohibitive to the locals, as I said that, uh, yes, you are mentioning about like Kipia, you know, if somebody has his own land and, you know, he has the mandate to manage his or her own land the way he wants. So uh, the community conservancies are completely different. It's managed by the community, the local communities, using their own uh, community structures, as you heard from Tom, you know, the group ranches. 
This is a land that is owned by the communities on a group ranch setup as a community. So it is them who will make the decision. But for the private ranches, it's completely different. It's the owner of the land uh, who, uh, who will make the decision. Uh, yes, COVID-19 has actually um, made these, some of these, uh, these facilities or these ranches or these conservancies to bring their prices down to, you know, for, for uh, and, and I'm sure by now the locals can actually be able to, uh, to access them or to afford them. So uh, I want to say that, uh, you know, for the community conservancies, it's completely different. It's managed by the community and not um, any, any white man. Uh, and you can actually visit these communities and you can hear from them, uh, you know, as I'm sure, you know, you are meeting them, uh, people like Tom, people like Nicole, uh, and myself, we are from this community. So you, they can be able to tell what it is. Then, um, yeah, the question about, uh, Marius is asking about uh, whether community conservancies uh, as an emerging land use disrupted national land use, uh, land uses, e.g. grazing that support a livestock economy of long, especially for livestock keepers. Uh, I can actually say uh, with a lot of um, authority that, uh, you know, the, the conservancies has not actually uh, disrupted the traditional la land uses. The thing is, they have actually strengthened. Our model of working is strengthen the traditional um, structures, the traditional leadership structures. For example, NRT is actually led by the Council of Elders. The chairman of all the conservancies uh, in Kenya come together and form the highest arm or the highest body of NRT. And these are the people who come and sit down and make a decision on, their, on behalf of their communities at the NRT level and they guide NRT on NRT activities. So, and, and, and if you look at uh, what we are talking about, uh, the community conservancies, in fact, uh, you know, the conservancies are able to plan their land uh, depending on what they need as a community, plan where they graze their livestock, plan where they can put uh, their, their tourism activities, plan where they put their settlement, their schools, their dispensaries, or their hostels. They are the ones who actually uh, plan. And if you look at the Wildlife Act as well, uh, this is supported by legislation where every conservancy must have a management plan and a management plan is supposed to stipulate all those um, management zones or activity zones in that conservancy. So it has not um, actually interfered, but it has actually strengthened, uh, you know, through the grazing committees. The grazing committees you have heard from Tom are the elders from those villages. So they are actually the ones who are making decisions on how they manage their own land. Uh, thank you. I thank you, Daniel. Uh, can we please uh, first stop there and then we'll come to uh, the Q&A later. Uh, I'm not able to raise Tom again. Uh, so I know he'll join us at some point. So I'd like to go to Nicole. Nicole, uh, are you ready? Yes, I am. Kiundu. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, if you could unmute uh, and, and then uh, we'll go straight to introductions, I introduce you and your topic today. I'm uh, hoping we get Tom later. And uh, for you, uh, I know you, you're not having a PowerPoint presentation, so uh, I think we'll be okay with the technology, hopefully. Uh, yes. So, <laughs> yeah. Uh, so Nicole uh, is the assistant manager at Saruni Lodge in, in Kalama Community Conservancy. Uh, so I know Nicole will be able to tell us, you know, uh, you know, the, uh, how, what is a lodge and a community conservancy, uh, how you, you know, uh, differentiate uh, the two. And her topic today will be earning from tourism uh, through the community conservation model and the impact that COVID-19 is having. And uh, most importantly, uh, we're looking to the solutions, you know, that people are using to overcome because as uh, you can tell, it seems COVID is here to stay with us. So we have to, uh, to, to learn how to, you know, to overcome it, uh, uh, so to speak. Uh, so as I said, Nicole is the assistant manager at the Saruni Lodge, one of the community enterprises at Kamala uh, Community Conserv Conservancy. She has worked here for seven years. Nicole has a passion for conserv conservation tourism, you know, having coming from this community. Uh, because uh, she knows tourism has not had only direct uh, 
you know, ha has not benefited her directly, uh, but, but it has also enabled the community around the conservancy uh, to understand and appreciate that they can depend on wildlife and conservation as an alternative source of livelihood. Uh, she started as a housekeeper immediately after her O levels, and today she's a holder of two diplomas in hospitality and human resource and looking to do a bachelor's degree on the same. Uh, so I think Nicole uh, this is you know, very important uh, background. Uh, you, you can tell us more uh, you know, about your story and, uh, and, and how you became manager at this launch as you continue to the topic. Welcome. Thank you very much, Kyundu. And uh, as you've introduced me as Nicole Lengima, and my journey in conservation started a while ago after my primary school education. That's when I got my scholarship, my high school scholarship from Save the Elephants organization. And from there, that's when I started having passion in conservation, both wildlife and vegetation. And after my high school, I, I was uh, supposed to enroll uh, for my uh, college. But I had there was a vacancy in a new lodge called Saruni Lodge in Kalama Conservancy. That's why I took my application as a housekeeper. I, I took Uh, seems we also having a challenge uh, with Nicole. Nicole, can you hear me? Hello. Okay. Uh, Tom is back. Hello, Tom. Hello, Tom. Uh, hello. Oh, um, uh, Kiundu, I'm sorry. Uh, I had a power blackout all of a sudden, and I had to relocate, uh, change to a power backup, uh, a solar power backup. Uh, I'm oh. really sorry for this. I couldn't see a uh, power blackout coming. And it just, uh, I, I, I know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know. We, we, we never solar, you know, plan for this thing. Too. I was on so Wi-Fi zone. OK. Yeah. So okay, can you use your phone on the landscape mode, uh, please, like this? Yeah, like, yes. yeah. yeah. Yes, thank you so much. Uh, do you want me to continue uh, with your presentation to yes. share? OK. Uh, yeah, I hope I'm sharing the, yes, I'm sharing the update one. So, yeah, you okay. can continue. OK. Uh, mm -hmm. Where were we? I think we can start from here. Innova innovation in terms of COVID-19. Slide number six. Yes, six. yes, yes. So I was just trying to elaborate on the on the photos. That is slide number six. Mm -hmm. There. Mm -hmm. Then there. So I was trying to elaborate on the figure one, that is uh, uh, the staff leadership and uh, board and staff leadership and management training program, and also the AGM uh, report uh, presentation of audit and progress, uh, annual progress, and also uh, the uh, uh, board elections after every three years uh, in AGMs. And the last, uh, the last photo is figure four. Uh, it captures right trust officials lecturing the team on principles of good regland and grazing management. Also, you can see storage of grass seeds, that is Simplex, Hilaris, and Masai of grass, uh, Simplex. Uh, that has really impacted our community because uh, we engaged them in doing uh, some TNC sponsored grass plots uh, to develop grass banks. And also on April, we did some acacia efficiency clearing to come up with grass bags uh, in settlement zones. So this exposure to us are really very, 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 very impacting. And uh, we would want to see uh, 
the kind of uh, socioeconomic uh, transformation is going to bring to our communities. So next, I'll go to slide number seven, uh, innovations in time of COVID-19. Um, the Conservancy undertook a teacher revisions, uh, clearing in April 2020, just in the wake of COVID-19 in the country. Approvals was made from provincial administration and Samburu in sub county COVID-19 task force after complying with all the basic guidelines as offered by MOH, that is Ministry of Health. An initial idea of concentrating 510 people in a camp in the Conservancy for 13 days was halted, and a village-based model adopted uh, that allowed a maximum of 10 people uh, per unit when on social distancing. The 29 villages were identified and for the first time clearing was done outside the conservancy in settlement zones. Why it not of that? Uh, uh, the provincial administration wouldn't have allowed us uh, to continue with the clearing exercise uh, because it involved a lot of laborers and definitely uh, trying to uh, instill COVID-19 tenants will be, will be a problem but being creative enough to ensure that the community wouldn't have lost uh, uh, the level of the program because a lot of money was paid in labor, uh, we had to sit down with the NRC Redlands uh, Department and come up with ideas that is going to ensure that uh, the COVID-19 uh, guidelines are there too uh, and very adequately uh, so that uh, we, 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 we could continue. Uh, we had to also bring in government officials, uh, county, uh, uh, village, and uh, ward administrators, uh, and also hiring of uh, public health uh, officials to ensure that uh, at least the guidelines are going to be uh, well, uh, uh, well adhered to, as stipulated, and uh, the ex the thing is exercise to move on uh, very smoothly. We ensure that we never lost the level to the people. And uh, indeed, it was needed uh, at that very uh, tough time. Uh, board meetings uh, will normally have uh, any number of people to infinity. But uh, because of the COVID-19 uh, government policy, we are observing a maximum of 15 people, that is uh, the 13 board members and the EXO issues. So we will normally uh, try to figure out which board members we, we, we will encourage uh, to, uh, to stay back at home uh, so that we can have the relevant stakeholders uh, come in and ensure that that number uh, uh, is a maximum uh, of 15. So we will normally try to interchange. When we don't need stakeholders, we'll have our full board members and one or two uh, staff members to ensure that they are 15 uh, maximum in number. Uh, COVID-19 gear must always be provided in every meeting. Uh, also, during community outreach, which the government discourages at all costs. And if the consumers feel the need to undertake this, we will normally follow due diligence uh, process. As you can see, all community outreach meetings must be communicated to provincial administration and approvals seek from sub-county COVID-19 task force. COVID-19 gear must be provided in the meeting like face masks for everyone and washing containers with soap and observing social distancing. Government officials must attend to instill adherence to COVID-19 tenants. So we actually ensure that mm -hmm. we don't risk anyone coming to our meetings or we don't risk the community members when we go out there uh, to engage them. Uh, as you can see, mm -hmm. uh, so that is slide number eight. Uh, there are diagrams there. Yeah? yeah, yeah, the photos. Uh, figure number five public participation, the data air settlement zone on proposed Kalama Resource Center construction project in Nasha, Kalama Conservancy. You can see lady seated, the social distancing, and all are wearing masks. Also, figure six. From the pictures below, you can see hand washing container at the entrance of the boardroom shed. All participants in a meeting wearing masks and observing social distancing, also in the field when community levels are clearing the 
you can see hand washing container just at the entrance of our bottom shed. Also, when member of community are, cut, are clearing artificial efficiency in the field, they ensure uh, uh, social distancing is observed. And we have area chiefs, uh, county, uh, ward, and village administration officers coming around to see if that is there. To. We also have these hand washing containers in place. And uh, people normally have to wash their hands before they go to field or later on when they are just from field uh, going back home. Uh, they have to sanitize. That's how we do it. Uh, slide number nine. Uh, we have 20 women and 20 Morans from Westgate and Kalama Community Conservancy in Samburu were the latest to undergo the leadership and management program training conducted by NRT Sustainability Team, which is headed by Dan Letoye, we just presented. Uh, the 40 participants were taken through a four-day training that covered the second module of the four-module LAMP uh, course, which equips the participants with the leadership and finance management skills to enable them to maximize entrepreneurial opportunities for the consumers and move towards self-reliance. This happened about two weeks ago. And uh, you can see all the women are wearing masks, um, also, the social distancing observed. Uh, next, slide number 10. Uh, what are also the benefits uh, that the community uh, gets from the conservancy? You can see uh, in the pictures, uh, NRC training ceremony uh, of bidwork check handover to Kalama Conservancy and livestock to market conservation which is always 5% of animal, I mean, annual bid sales and can is 2,000 for every cattle sold. Kalama has over 300 women in bid work project, over 50 youth as members of NRT Trading Sako, and many livestock to market uh, uh, beneficiaries. These are some uh, of the projects that are impacting to the community, giving them uh, the socioeconomic uh, uh, well being. And I think as brief as enough, I have tried to be, uh, that is the end of my presentation on community engagement. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Tom. Uh, sorry again for that uh, technological hitch, uh, but I'm sure our uh, audience and colleagues have uh, understood and I'll continue to ask you, uh, good people, to ask you questions on the Q&A. I see on chats, uh, some people are still putting their questions on, on chat. Uh, for archival purposes, kindly let's go to uh, the Q&A. And uh, we'll ask these questions in a few minutes. Uh, let's hear again from uh, Nicole, uh, and then we'll move to uh, Tem Letiwa. So Nicole, uh, please pick it up from where you left. And sorry for that again. No problem, Kiundu. So okay. from my housekeeping training, uh, I, I got my first promotion as a shop attendant whereby the community shop, whereby we sell the beadwork from the community surround was started and they thought I would be the best candidate for that. And that's how I started my administration career. Then from there, I took my stores, purchase and supplies computer training by the owner of the camp as well here. And after that, that's when I took my first uh, diploma um, uh, in hospitality management and I got my promotion as an assistant manager. And um, after that, I also took a diploma a course in uh, human resource management. And that got my promotion as well after my hard work of many years as a manager now, a full camp manager, actually the uh, a first local woman from the Samburu community managing the camp. And I appreciate my employer, Saruni Lodges, because that is part of the women empowering project they are doing in all the conservancies, as well as the Mara property. And on my background of where I come from, I come from a, a small village called Lorubai. That's why I, I was raised, I schooled there, and lucky enough, I'm now working in the community as well. So I have double perspective in uh, 
in uh, earning uh, both in conservancy because I'm a member of Kalama Community Conservancy as well as Saruni Lodge. And just to elaborate on something about the Kalama Community Conservancy, it's a, it's a spontaneous participant. That is uh, whereby the community has the power to make decision as well as control of the development project in the conservancy, unlike the National Reserve. And with that, we have a board of committee from Kalama, led by uh, their chairman, vice chair, secretary, and the Kalama community manager. And um, we have lots of activities going on uh, between Kalama and Saruni, whereby we uh, Saruni pays uh, Kalama Conservancy a good amount of revenue for the last couple of years since it was started. It's uh, 11 years since we started the camp. And um, to approach some of the incentives that are necessary to motivate the local people in uh, conservancy, we support um, warriors in a, in a ground whereby they perform local dances to our guests as well as um, participating in some activities like the Warriors Academy. For women, we support them through the beadwork uh, shop whereby we get stuff from their, 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 their respective um, villages. And then we get them sold here and we give 100% of the sales back to the women. And also for the kids, we have our uh, annual uh, kids activities whereby we take kids from Kiltamaj Primary School to the National Reserve to show them the importance and the beauty of the wildlife conservation as well as uh, vegeta uh, vegetation uh, conservation. And that molds them to be ambassadors in the future and also in the community where they come from. Some of the benefits that uh, Saruni indulge in uh, supporting the community is through employment. Our staff, 95% of our staff are from the local community and we train them here, majority of them. The 5% are some of uh, uh, crucial departments like the chefs, like uh, mechanics and some other And also uh, we do support um, Kalama through other um, conservation, uh, like having their rangers around while they're doing the monitoring of the wildlife. And uh, that supports, that helps us to monitor the number of wildlife we have uh, and the growth. That will show us if we are in the positive angle or we have to do something about supporting it. And also recently we started a project of uh, planting acacias, whereby we throw seed balls in the conservancies, in the conservancy around. And that helps us in, um, in um, raising the number of acacias. And also uh, for the partnerships, we have good partnership with NRT and Kalama. And uh, together with the, three, with the three bridges, we are able to be in control of the three pillars of conservancies. That is uh, the local people, the wildlife, and the tourists. And uh, due to the COVID-19, which, uh, which has hit us big time, we have faced a lot of challenges of like um, uh, no income from the tourism, and that made us uh, to cut off some of our staff. And um, it really affected them, but uh, we considered some of our staff while they were home. We kept on uh, uh, paying a 50% pay, uh, pay to them. And also on another angle, um, we resumed uh, some days ago, whereby the measures uh, that we took uh, we tested all our staff members. Currently, we have 19 staff, and uh, that is because of uh, uh, minimizing uh, the number of people in one place. 
and uh, we've uh, uh, taken them through a training by the Ministry of Health on the the precautions to be taken uh, this moment. And also we have our hand washing stations everywhere, sanitizers, and also we got uh, the Ministry of Health team and also a, a company which fumigates our camp some days ago so that we'll be ready to receive our guests in the next couple of days. And um, we'll be happy to host uh, our local guests as well. And they are really supporting us. And uh, what we expect now is support from our, both our local uh, tourists and um, as well as uh, international in the future if, if everything goes uh, okay. Kiundu. Uh, th thank you so much, uh, Nicole. Uh, wait a minute. Uh, thank you uh, very much, uh, Nicole, uh, for your presentation. Is that uh, you are at Saruni Lodge as you're speaking now? Yes, I'm, I'm here in the bush. Yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, there are a few questions I see, uh, but I would like to come to you in 10 minutes after we uh, hear from Mr. Tom. Okay, no problem. Hello? Hello, Kyundu? Yes, can, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Yes, I, I'm saying I'll come to you after 10 minutes after we hear from Tom Letiwa. And, and then we can talk more, you know, about tourism and how, you know, you know, how you have uh, been uh, living uh, in these hard times. So um, I, I see the question is still coming, so we'll ask this in 10 minutes. Uh, Mr. Tom Letu, I hope you can hear me. Hello? No. Yes, uh, are you able to hear me? Yes, I hear you. Okay, okay thank you so much. Uh, I'll go ahead and introduce you and then you can uh, take over. Uh, so you'll be our last speaker for today. Uh, thank you so much for that. Uh, so uh, Mr. Tom Letiwa is the manager uh, Namunyak Community Conservancy. Uh, he will tell us about Namunyak, where it is, what it does, and, and then he'll tell us about uh, the NRT support uh, to the community conservation model uh, using his uh, case study, and, and especially now during the COVID-19 era, uh, because I, I, I think uh, we can be remiss to ask that question, you know, like, uh, how are you surviving? So uh, please, uh, Mr. Tom Letua, let us know about uh, your conservation uh, model at Namunyak. Uh, the floor is yours. Yeah, Kyundo, I know that you, you put that presentation. Sent. Do you have it ready? I'll be the... uh, oh, yes. Um, My PowerPoint presentation. Can you be able okay, to put... Okay, let me put it up in a minute. Sorry. Yeah. yeah. Putting it up now. Yeah. Uh, you can introduce yourself as I. Yeah. Good yeah. afternoon, everybody. My name is Tom Letiwa, the conservation manager for Namnyak Wildlife Conservation Trust. It's an umbrella organization of three conservation units of Namnyak. And uh, Namnyak uh, is one of the oldest conservancies in Kenya that was formed in 1995 and uh, it started small in 1995 and by by the year 2008 it expanded to cover an area of uh, 324,000 hectares so Okay. Um, yeah, there thank you. Is. Okay. You okay, thank ahead. you so much, Kiundu, for putting my presentation. Uh, so, the, the first page there is a, is a pillar of the Namunyak Wildlife Conservation, one of the Ololoku Mountains, 
who is very popular for rock climbing and uh, a sacred mountain in the community area. Can move, move forward, move forward. Yeah, so as I said, that Namnyak was established and registered in 1995 as a trust. And uh, later on, it expanded, it, expanded, it started small with 95,000 hectares and later on expanded to 324,000 hectares. And it encompasses uh, six group ranges of the Namnya community. Kiundu. So it covers uh, 324,000 hectares. And um, it started as a small conservancy, and now it encompasses three conservation areas. That is Nalawon, that's the area of Saran and Sapache group ranges. And then we have Ngilai, that is from Ngilai West and Ngilai Central group ranges. And then Kalepo, which are also two group ranges of Donya White. And got another. Can do? Yeah, yeah. Before that, that is the map of Namnyak area. Find the north. It's a. In the north is a, a the Kalepo unit of Namnyak. Under the central, we have Ngilai unit of Namnyak, and then the another one unit of Namnyak, which is in the south, which was the original conservancy of Namnyak before we expand to cover the other two units. So that's where the Namnyak Conservancy is. It's one of the member conservancies of Northern Rogerlands Trust. So our core areas of operations is that uh, Namnyak uh, does community development activities. Uh, because of the revenue we approve from tourism, we do, we provide bursaries to students. So last year we were able to, to pay a bursary of uh, 8 million Kenya shillings, that's about 800,000 US dollars. And then we, we also help in health services, we provide the uh, uh, National Hospital Insurance Cover to some of our members. We also support education, uh, infrastructure. We support also roads and airstrips as part of the development of the community. Those are some of the activities we do. And also the normal activities of the conservancy like the provision of security for wildlife, livestock, and people. So Namnyak is endowed with the four tourism facilities. There is Sarara Eco Lodge. There's a tree house, which we also refer as Rhino Boma. And there's Kitish and Kikwar, a new facility that has been, has been established in, in Kalepo Conservancy. We also have, uh, you see from the map, we had the forest inside the Namnyak area. Uh, and that mountain forest is called Marius Forest. And it's a forest that uh, provides uh, pasture rescue during the drought season and water to the communities around Namnyak areas. We also have wildlife monitoring and research being undertaken in Namnyak. And uh, the famous uh, Teti Elephant Sanctuary, which is a the only community uh, uh, owned sanctuary, elephant sanctuary uh, in Africa and probably even in the world. So the Red Elephant Sanctuary is also within the Namnyak Wildlife Conservation Area. We also have one of the unique fenders, like the Livestock Conservation Fund, which the Conservancy uh, support uh, the, the communities who are injured by elephants or, or when their livestock are attacked by elephants, or when, they are, when, when they get injured. So the, the Livestock Conservation Fund it's an initiative for the conservancy, and we have introduced it to help the community uh, be able to, 
to, to be able to coexist with the wild animals. And uh, also partnerships with, our, with the other members of the, or with our other partners like the Northern Regional Trust, the conservancies, the government, the, the national and the county governments. So we do partnership with, with them. So those are our core areas that we, we do in, in Namnya. Next. Yeah, so the, during this time, we, we really had a, a lot of uh, impact created by the, the, the current COVID-19, which is ongoing all over the world. So that disease has impacted too much on tourism. And uh, Namnyak is uh, normally one of the conservancies that uh, gets a lot of revenue from its uh, tourism facilities. And uh, we expect this year we, are, we may not be able to get uh, any revenue because we have never had tourism all the way from, from uh, March up to date and probably up to the end of the year. So it's likely that we are going to have a lot of losses in revenue and also uh, people are going to lose their employment. Next is that there are, we have also the problem of market closures due to this COVID-19. Most of the, the communities normally depend on the, on the markets to sell their livestock, but uh, due to the current COVID-19, there is closure of markets and uh, this automatically will have impacts on the household's income. Uh, COVID-19 has also impacted on the living, uh, on the cost of living. Like now the transport, very, you can get a, to go to a place like Isiolo, you have to pay something like a thousand, which is just a very, that's something that people used to pay 400 shillings, so it has not doubled. The cost of, of goods have also gone up. So the community is actually facing a lot of challenges. There is also lack of access to education due to COVID-19. Currently, we have got to all the students, primary, secondary, and up to colleges and the universities, they are all at home and they are not able to access the, the education, mainly because uh, they cannot afford, uh, they cannot be able to afford and most of them are not, uh, are, not, uh, are, not, are not able to do fashion learning like in other countries. We also expect a possible threat of wildlife due to poaching. Uh, health services are also minimal and sparse. So if the disease now uh, is going to be reported within the, the area that uh, NRT is covering. So we may likely be able to have a bigger impact. Next. Kiundu. Next. Yeah. Yeah, uh, from the NRT side, they, they, have thought, they have put a lot of uh, initiatives to be able to help the communities during this time of the COVID-19. One of the, the issues they are doing is that they are trying to enhance the fundraising to help to replace the lost tourism funds. Secondly, they have introduced, uh, there is normally what we call NRT livestock markets. So they, are now, they have now partnered with the the interior government of the interior government and they are able to provide the uh, markets for cattle during this time with a strict uh, and adherence to the COVID-19 regulations. Uh, the, other, the other issue they are doing is that they are ensuring that uh, their employees remain at work and especially the rangers who are in charge of the security, they are doing they are doing it 24/7 to ensure that the security of people, livestock, and wildlife 
se, se strengthen. They have also created uh, uh, some preventive uh, measures, digital platforms, so that uh, the guidelines that NRT have developed, they are being shared towards these uh, digital platforms like WhatsApp groups for conservancies, WhatsApp groups for uh, for council of elders, WhatsApp groups for for youth, so so that they are, it's, it's like creating awareness too, so that they will be able to know how the, this disease is is going to be uh, to be prevented. Yeah, next. You do. Yes, I've moved. I've moved to the next slide. Yeah. So another initiative that NRT has taken to caution the, the communities is that uh, during this time, water supply projects to support areas where water is scarce has been implemented in very many areas so that the communities are able to, to get water to use for uh, to be able to use that water uh, because it's a very essential uh, item that will be able to, to help the communities prevent the, the COVID-19. Uh, through education, NRT is funding transmission of daily school lessons on local radio broadcasts. Uh, so it's doing this in areas like uh, CLO, so that they're using local radios to be able to reach to to, to students in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in 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 its areas of operations. So that's one of the initiatives they're also doing. Uh, another initiative the NRC has taken is that uh, they have enhanced their partnership with the uh, national and county governments, so that the, the conservancies are included in the government COVID nineteen response and recovery fund so that uh, uh, the government was able to to put some funding towards the conservancies at the national level and even at the conservancy level so this time around conservancies are a little bit better because they'll be able to get to get uh, some support from the government both at the national and the county level and uh, this one will ensure that their staffs or the conservancy staffs will be able to remain at work, and they will be able to, 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 to do their routine activities of supporting the community, security, and security of people, wildlife, and livestock. Next. Yeah, so in conclusion, uh, conservancies are the ideal local institutions that provide solutions to their local problems hence building the community resilient. So you can see there a picture of uh, uh, Samburu women making video, video and then they will be able to sell through what we call the NRT trading. And uh, the other, so they do these things together and, and uh, it will be able to have the, 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 the uh, support their livelihoods. Next. Thank you. So uh, that's, uh, the picture there is uh, for the Teti Elephant Sanctuary. This is one of the, uh, the core projects of Nomniak. And uh, it's still ongoing and uh, supporting the, the rehabilitation, uh, re uh, rehabilitation and then the rewilding of the elephant, uh, the elephant babies. Thank you. So uh, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Letua, uh, for that good presentation. And uh, I, I think, yeah, that's a place to visit. Is it open uh, to people to visit, Reteti? Sounds interesting. Yeah, Reteti is open, uh, but uh, we had stopped it uh, during the COVID-19 period so that we'll be able to cash on our staffs uh, from uh, the, 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 the virus. Okay, definitely. Uh, thank you again. Uh, I think I didn't mention your bio, and uh, I see you coming with 25 years in safeguarding nature and environment uh, for over uh, two decades. 
uh, and uh, Mr. Letiwa is also uh, working as an officer at K K KWS, having undergone uh, paramilitary uh, training in Manyani in 1993. He joined Namunyak in 2000 to help his community in protecting Northern Kenya's critically endangered species, like we've mentioned, the reticulated giraffe, uh, the gravy zebra, the wild dog, and others. As the manager of Namunyak, Tom has steered the conservancy to commendable heights, the conservancy generating 40 million shillings in revenue in 2019 alone. Uh, uh, so Mr. Letiwa, we're going into, and all the other panelists, uh, we're going into Q&A questions. And since you're here and you've mentioned your expertise, uh, you know, as an officer at KWS, uh, paramilitary training, and there, there is a question that uh, was asked here. And uh, again, people, when you're asking questions, please uh, direct it to a particular panelist uh, so that we're able to put it to them. I see most of the questions have been not addressed, but I want to address this to you. I'm trying to uh, rotate the question. Uh, this is Dingani Masuku. He doesn't say uh, where he is from, but he says a quick one. Due to COVID-19, has there been a rise in poaching? If so, is this for bushmeat or we seeing endangered species like rhino, elephant, and even pango pangolin? Are these cases rising? Yeah. Uh, of late, we had about uh, two incidences of uh, elephants killed. So we are able to, rec to recover the tasks. Uh, uh, we, we may not be able to, to determine whether it, really, it was really due to pushing or uh, due to conflict. Uh, but uh, we lost two elephants uh, during the period. So we cannot be able to say uh, it's due to pushing. But for subsistence uh, pushing, we, uh, we, we lost about two uh what did rough during the period and uh we we suspect this may, maybe this is mainly due to the problems of COVID-19. Okay uh, and are we seeing cases of uh small animals you know bush meat like antelopes going up? Yeah you know giraffe uh, is a it's actually pushed for subsistence but it is a uh, people go and kill uh, when there are many and then they will use the meat for, uh, for subsistence purposes. But we have not, uh, for these small species like uh, gazelles, uh, dig digs, uh, we, 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 are, we, we have not uh, uh, received such threats. Uh, okay, uh, thank you so much uh, for yeah, that. Uh, I think you want to, you want to, I, yes. just want, I just want to contribute to that question. Uh, yeah, it's true. Yeah, it's, as, as Tom mentioned, it's one of the high risks that we are facing right now during this time of COVID. Uh, although right now it's still not so bad, but it's likely to really uh, go up. In some other parts of uh, the country, uh, you know, for Namnyak maybe and Kalama and some other conservancies that have been dealing a lot with these big mammals, they might not have uh, actually felt that. But in some count, uh, counties, like for example, in, uh, in the coast, we have, we have seen uh, a quite a significant rise of these, um, you know, uh, bushmeat. Uh, on, 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 on this more uh, animal. So it's, it's something that is really coming up. Okay, thank you so much uh, for that, um, Mr. Daniel. And I'll also still come back to you. Uh, there is a question that was asked early on by Wesley uh, Langat. Uh, Langat is a freelance journalist uh, from Nairobi. He mostly contributes for the Thomson Reuters. And he has a long question. I don't know how we are able to answer this. Uh, he says, uh, Conservancies are an ideal model for wildlife conservation and protection of habitats while supporting the livelihoods of surrounding communities. But of late, the climate change, uh, spaces for development, this has become written at some point, an entry point, by an entry point for infrastructure development, uh, which rapidly regain momentum once these areas get converted into private development, which later harbors unsustainable development that destroy ecosystem endangering wildlife. How can the livelihoods and financial gains from other developments be balanced with wildlife conservation? Do you think the model of wildlife conservation will not be written in the near future? Uh, and do communities around conservancies continue to practice uh, their original sources of livelihoods like pastoralism? 
I know this is quite a mouthful, but uh, please try to take it as best as you can while telling us, do we find this, because I know this is prevalent, like when it comes to Nairobi National Park, do we see private developments happening in these conservancies? Yes. Um, yeah, thank you so much, uh, Wesley. Uh, that is very true. Uh, the, the development or the infrastructural development is actually one of the biggest uh, threats now we are trying to uh, address or we are dealing with uh, in, this, in this country. And that is very true. Even the, uh, the conservancies, uh, you know, the communities are really struggling to manage uh, the balance between the conservation work the pastoralism and uh, these other developments. For example, now in Northern Kenya, we are having what we call the lapses coming up. You know, the issues of uh, these uh, power lines coming up and cutting across the conservation areas. It is really, really, really a big, a big challenge. Uh, you know, kind of destroying the wildlife habitat, kind of uh, destroying the, the tourism uh, attractions. But, uh, you know, some of these things are driven politically. So it becomes a little bit uh, very challenging. And also to balance between between conservation and this development, it's not easy, but it is something that is affecting us. On, on pastoralism, it's still affected the same way the wildlife is affected uh, by these uh, development projects. Like now, definitely, some of these development projects are coming up. For example, the, 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 the Isiro Resource City is taking up a huge chunk of grazing lands in, in Isiro. But you see, this is, this is a development that no one can be able to say, you know, we don't want de development, but it's really, for sure, it's affecting the wildlife habitat and it's also affecting the pastoralism way of life of these pastoral communities. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Um, there is this question from Miriam uh, Murigi. Uh, Daniel, before you go, is, um, is community conservancy the way to go uh, to end human wildlife conflict? And Anne Mikia from Nairobi is also asking, she's from One Habari Center, is tree planting uh, would really change how the northern part of Kenya looks? Are there any plans for such activities to happen? Or do we have these at NRT and all of uh, these com uh, conservancies, you know, efforts to plant trees? Yeah, for, for Miriam, um, uh, I want to say uh, very true, the conservancies is actually the way to go to, you know, to address the human wildlife conflict. And this is because the conservancies have actually developed it's an innovative model where communities can, uh, are trying to develop a way they can coexist with wildlife. And they can only coexist with wildlife if they see some tangible benefits that they can, uh, that are, are can accrue from wildlife. Like now what Tom discussed about, you know, the bursaries, you know, the, the water project, the education pro, pro, program. You know, it's the best way that uh, communities can be able to coexist because they, they are able to see the benefits from this wildlife and they can be able to, you know, to relate the same with, with wildlife and, and, and also other, 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 other uh, land use sources. So that is, yeah, it is very true. Uh, as we have also seen in this country, Kenya, uh, in particular, the government is not able to, you know, to implement the, the compensation uh, scheme where the, the, the government is supposed to, uh, to compensate. But uh, as an option, it, the conservation model, I mean, the, the, the conservancy model is actually the way that these communities can be able to exist with wildlife. Uh, thank you so much. Be, Before I, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, no, no, yeah. let, let, me, let me read uh, some other one here that I think is related to that uh, before I ask questions to the other uh, speakers. Uh, so this, this one is related to the human wildlife conflict uh, from Faith Onea. Uh, she's asking, how has culture and cultural practices affected your work, um, both positively and negatively? And as you take that one, I, I think this one, other one is related to culture. And I like the question from Alan Mungai, who yeah. works uh, for the Standard here in Kenya. He's asking, NRT has a program where they screen cartoons about conservation to the community. Can Tom tell us how that is working out? Okay, uh, we'll come to Tom, but uh, Daniel, you can take those two, please. And then we yeah. Come to Tom. Yeah. yeah, for culture and cultural practices, um, yes, uh, the the culture has has definitely been affected, and 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 uh, you know, like for example, now the tourism. Uh, the tourism is is uh, on a positive note. Tourism is actually trying to encourage culture, and and communities are now using their culture as a source of income and as a source of uh, revenue. So that has, that has definitely. Um, you know, affected, uh, you know, 
our work and also you know the the, the, the communities at large. On the negative as well, definitely there is a lot of uh, because of these conservancies, because of this uh, tourism, there is a lot of influence with the modern or the Western uh, culture coming in. So the culture has also been affected on a negative part of it because you know you know this this the the you know, the, the people who are coming from outside into those communities, the development, you know, the railways, the highways are really affecting the cultural lifestyle of the community. So yes, that is true, it is affecting, but it's also, you know, one of the things we are trying to do is also to encourage communities now to earn or to use culture as a source of income. And that is one of the biggest uh, attraction in Northern Kenya, you know, for the Samburus, for the Turkanas, you know, their rich culture is, is now turning to be a, a, a source of revenue. Uh, on uh, on the cartoon, yes, uh, I know Tom will also mention to that. But you know, the cartoon program is is, is going on very well, and this is as kind of um, you know an easier way to create to create awareness on people who are not able to read and write. You know, the action on on the cartoon is actually a, a good way, and that is why you know it was an innovative way to for NRT to to try to reach. To the local communities without necessarily talking English or Swahili, but they can be able to see how how this the impact of uh, you know the, this these negative impacts, for example, land degradation is happening, uh, you know, in their area and how it impacts in their life. So it's an easy way to pass the message on what is happening and the changes that are coming as a result of the you know the a number of other things that are affecting our livelihood. So it's working very well. Yeah, that's uh, really very interesting and innovative, as you said. Uh, so, uh, Tom, uh, do you want to take uh, that's Tom Lolo Soli? Uh, I you have two Toms. Uh, so, if you're asking yes. another question to Tom, please um, uh, be specific. Uh, Tom Lolo Soli, do you want to take this or is it Latiwa? <laughs> uh, about the cartoon. Yes, the cartoon was asked on you, and I thought uh, the culture one, you're all uh, able to oh, answer yeah, that. I think that you work with the Morans and the communities, uh, so to speak. Yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, the cartoons are used to create a visual effect to enhance contextual learning, also social skills, and uh, collaborative uh, learning and enhancing critical thinking. Uh, in our case, we have village based community uh, training, we call them VBCs. And uh, that targets different social groups uh, like elders, women, and uh, youth. Uh, the youth involves uh, the Morans, uh, also the others uh, who are also lads, you know, uh, those boys who have not yet been initiated uh, and are the ones who are actively uh, encroaching the conservancy. Uh, uh, also, you see, uh, this, uh, the cartoons impact well to the uh, illiterate community because they can easily digest uh, the content, they are visual. And uh, also, we mostly uh, use uh, cartoons to promote principles of good rangeland and grazing management, uh, also both in small scale and entire landscape perspective, as well as uh, uh, as well as uh, grazing bylaws. Uh, it's also we also use it for means for conflict resolution and peace, uh, enhancing peace among the communities. Okay, uh, thank you. Yeah, thank you so much, Tom. Uh, I don't, there's a question for Nicole, uh, but I don't know if oh, she's there. Uh, Nicole, uh, there's a question I've seen here uh, from Joseph Chekabuje uh, from Kenya. Uh, what, with COVID 19 in place, what is the state of incentive, incentive support to locals? That's for you, Nicole. Yes, Kyundu, uh, at the moment, the incentives. Uh activities for the local communities we have stopped because of the COVID-19 that is because of the the high chances of exposing either the local people or the tourists so what we are doing is uh, the bid work uh, that we had before the COVID-19 in our gift shop we have fumigated it well and that's now how we are supporting them that is through the bid work we are not doing any extra outside activities because of the measures that were given by the Ministry of Health. Okay, uh, thank you so much. Uh, let me read uh, a question from uh, a guy from that area, uh, Kasim Osman from Misiolo County. 
my question is majorly directed to the general importance of conservancies to the people, a win-win formula, and the impact it has on the society. I'm asking these being uh, coming uh, these from one of sub counties. Uh, he says he's asking this because he comes from a sub county in Isiolo, where there is a perennial denial and bad picturing of NRT by the surrounding people. Uh, there is a case of insecurity which leads to loss of life. How can the conservancies bring permanent ad address on these? Uh, Mr. Daniel, if uh, you've been reading that question, uh, your take on it. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Kasim. Yeah, uh, yeah, that's very true. I I, I agree with you, uh, but I think uh, it is it's actually very clear on what our conservancies are doing to address on this, uh, you know, insecurity issue, and this is because of the network we have in our conservancy between Isiolo and the neighboring communities as well. So uh, you know, the conservancy rangers are there, as Tom mentioned, all of them are supported. Uh, NRT is still supporting them. NRT is working hard, uh, so hard to see that, uh, you know, uh, the conservancy rangers are still uh, working and um, the insecurity issues are being addressed by the rangers. And we also have um, what we call the peace, uh, peace and reconciliation team, which is actually led by a lady from Isiolo. So I think NRT is putting a lot of efforts on, on security and the conservancies are actually in the front line uh, with their vehicles, with their rangers, and with the support of the, the peace team to see that uh, this is being addressed. So uh, absolutely, yes, the conservancies are on top of, uh, of, of that, and I'm sure they are able to deal with it. Uh, Titus, uh, I do hope your question have been answered. Uh, let's go to Tim, uh, Tom Letiwa. Uh, there are challenges of land ownership and lease renewals for community conservancies whose leases have expired. Uh, some county governments are reluctant to renew, adding they can take over the land for resettling the landless people. How are you had handling such issues if you have them? That is, he says. Uh, this is Daniel Mwangi. Mr. Tom Lechewa. Yeah, do you hear me? I do, thank you, go ahead. Yeah, we, there's this uh, new act on uh, community land and group ranges. And the, 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 the community is actually slowly transitioning from the, from the group ranges act to the community land act. So NRT is actually supporting conservancies and so far, we have got uh, conservatives that have moved forward. Uh, I think uh, one of them is Kalama that is actually moving towards, uh, it has already started that process and it's almost completion. Ilingwesi group branch has also started and has completed and now it has transitioned completely. And also two Namnya group branches have also started the transition process. So basically that is how uh, they are changing. Uh, but I think the situation has, uh, has, has gone slowly from the time COVID has started, and that's why things are not moving very fast. Okay, uh, thank you so much uh, for that. Uh, there is another one I thought you also uh, should take. Uh, can, I, can you tell us a little bit more how you have included the youth in the conservation of uh, community conservancies other than the use of radio uh, for learning, which you mentioned in one of your slides. And before you take that, uh, colleagues, we have about uh, 20 minutes to the questions. If you have a question, please, uh, and if you're not able to answer all of them, we'll send them to our panelists, and we hopefully they'll be able to answer that, and we'll ask them for permission to also give us their contacts as we finish. Uh, so please uh, ask uh, your final questions now and direct them to a specific speaker and tell us who you are and who are you. I see people are not telling us who they work for or who are you writing from. Uh, Mr. Letua, you can go ahead with that. What was the question? Oops. Also, it, it was about other than uh, radio. How yeah. do you involve the youth in conservation and the young people? Yes, we, we have, uh, before the COVID-19, we used to have uh, forums. The, the, like now for Samburu, we have the Samburu Elites Forum. 
and we, uh, NRT organizes a forum in a place like uh, like Ashes Coast, and all uh, all those elites are brought in, and they'll be able to be told the work of NRT and conservancies. Uh, other than radios, we also have the 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 WhatsApp groups. We have the conservancies WhatsApp groups, and each I think each conservancy has one WhatsApp groups with members being part of them. And so the, any updates on conservancies is always given to one of those groups. Okay, uh, we've been mentioning a lot about uh, the endangered species, and someone uh, is saying someone is commending you, uh, our speakers, uh, for involving the community on conservation, especially with the children. That way it goes a long way in adding human wildlife conflict, uh, which uh, we all agree. Uh, so he's asking what kind of animals uh, do we find in the conservancies? Anyone can take yeah. this? Yeah, yeah maybe I can answer that. Mm -hmm. uh, we have got a unique species of animals that are found in Northern Kenya. Uh, like in uh, Namnyak, we have, found, we have got the, the, the elephant, the African elephant. We have got the reticulated giraffe, which is mainly endemic to northern Kenya. We have got the Beisa oryx. We have got to, uh, in the forest some unique species like the, the Brassa mangey and the white, uh, white black robus mangey. We have got so many species of birds. I, I think in Nam Nyagere we have about 200 species. We also have a variety of cats. Uh, we have, uh, we also have uh, the grave zebra, which is also a unique species of northern Kenya, and, uh, and very many other species of wildlife that you can be able to find within this area. Okay. Yeah, just, just, just Kiundu to add on what Thomas said. Uh, yeah, it's very true. Uh, you know, uh, if you go to the KWCA website, you will actually get a report that. Uh, there are some endangered species that are only found in, in the conservancies. Like now, for example, the gravy zebra. 90% of the global population of gravy zebras are actually found in, in the conservancies. Uh, more than 90% of the endangered uh, hirola um, antelope is also found in the conservancies. And also right now, you know, the, the, the white rhino, uh, we now have a significant population also of the white rhino in the conservancies. Both in the community conservancies and also in the private conservancies. So all these animals are there. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, I see my friend also who covers the Northeastern. His name is Abjata. He didn't put his question on the Q&A, but since I've seen it, I, I think Abjata, you please, please remember to put your Q&A, your question on the Q&A icon down there. Uh, so he's asking, how many conservancies do we have in Northern Kenya ecosystem? And what is the rationale of establishing a conservancy? I, I know uh, we have uh, probably mentioned these uh, in our slides, of course. Uh, but uh, as we answer that, um, I can give that to uh, Tom, uh, Lolo Soli. And, and then I come back to Peter Moirori, who asked the first question. He's asking another one to Nicole. Any, any other gentleman here. Some community conservancy-based lodges have collapsed due to conflicting interests of locals. Uh, and he says, do you remember Sean Pole? What are you doing as management to ensure locals' interests are well articulated that these community lodges can continue to harbor wildlife? Nicole, do you wanna take that? I would like to. Um, yes, I would like to. Okay, please go ahead. And um, as I explained myself uh, at first, is that we have a good relationship with the Kalama board uh, committee, whereby each village is represented in that committee, in that board of committee. And um, in case we see like the cattle encroachment, we don't go directly to the community, we report it to the Kalama, Kalama um, manager, and then it takes up with the committee and whereby they establish a, a group of um, elders that is being supported by the grazing committee uh, being funded by NRT, whereby they go and meet with those people who have their villages near the camp. They explain to them the positive things about the lodge we have here 
and the importance of keeping livestock away from um, core areas because we have some core areas around the Kalama Conservancy. And also in that, uh, we take it in a very um, um, polite way that is um, communicating one-on-one -on -one with them through the community, not us, through the board members of Kalama. And then that is being solved. And in case of uh, uh, more difficulties, you'll find the elders penalting certain families because they know people who encroach their livestock near the core areas. So they are given some penalties and then you'll find the discipline will be there, cursing in the community as well, if uh, someone doesn't adhere to what they are being told by the elders. So that really works. And uh, we really appreciate the Kalama uh, board uh, members, as well as the NRT grazing community, uh, committee. And also on the, other, uh, on the other angle is that uh, we try as much as possible to, to be the ambassadors of this lodge and the conservancy in our villages, whereby we tell people of more advantageous things that we get from this, uh, from this uh, property. And that helps so much. So I think the involvement of the community means a lot through a certain people. That is the bridges, which is the Kalama board members, the NRT grazing committee and the Saruni team. So that is how we handle um, such issues. Okay, thank you so much, Nicole, for that. Uh, Tom Lolosoli, um, Nicole has mentioned how you work at, uh, as, uh, at Kalama Community Conservancy. As the manager, uh, could you please take this question from uh, Abjata Khalif? I, I repeat it. He's asking like how many conservancies do we have in Northern Kenya ecosystem? What is the rationale of establishing one? And does the creation of one depend on land mass, wildlife population or any other issue? Uh, and what are the challenges uh, that are facing the management of these conservancies uh, on a day-to-day -day daily basis? I know you've mentioned COVID-19, what are other uh, challenges? And how uh, do communities from this area you know, uh, take these, uh, I like that, uh, take these, you know, kind of uh, management of conservancies. Uh, uh, are they 100% to it? Is there some resistance? If uh, kindly, uh, you could go ahead, Mr. Tom Laloso. Oh, uh, just to start with, uh, when we refer to Northern Kenya, uh, uh, three counties uh, uh, are actually under the cluster. That is Samburu, Masabi, and Istiolo. Uh, Samburu is the cradle of community conservancies uh, in northern Kenya and in fact uh, uh, pioneer conservancies uh, of the Northern Rwanda Trust. Uh, I can also extend the elaboration by saying it's the heartbeat. Uh, Samburu has nine conservancies, uh, Masabit has four, Isiolo has eight and that makes a total of uh, 21 conservancies in northern Kenya. Uh, we know uh, coming up with a conservancy as well as being a hot potato uh, because uh, there's been question of land, uh, people thinking, uh, uh, coming with the wild delegations that are setting up a conservancy. Uh, we have uh, the white supremacist uh, or so who are behind people uh, trying to hoodwink uh, the community to give land for conservancy, uh, stuff like that, which as always uh, just the uh, uh, as not a far-fetched uh, and unfounded. Uh, for community to come up with a conservancy, the interest should normally uh, be genuine and original from them. Uh, they, they have to request uh, a need of conservancy. And initially, how these uh, first conservancy uh, came up was uh, when Kenya Wildlife uh, Service uh, noticed that there was a need to set up uh, you know, community conservancy because uh, uh, of wildlife dispersal area, nearly over 90% of wildlife were roaming outside protected, uh, government protected areas. So uh, by community uh, having uh, seen the need, uh, getting sensitized to do a conservancy in a certain area, 
uh, at least there must be uh, some key factors uh, that uh, should be seen, like, for example, availability of wildlife in the area, uh, also as an economic alternative, because you, you see most of northern uh, Kenya uh, is not arable, and uh, also a need to enhance uh, uh, security in the area, because definitely we shall have armed rangers. And uh, there should be a kind of community structure and land tenure that has to enhance that. Community conservancy to set them up is very easy in group ranch areas uh, uh, during the, uh, as not in group ranch areas, which is now transforming to CLA 2016, that is Community Land Act 2016. Because the community have the say, the politicians cannot meddle. You have not to run to the county government, uh, try to like, uh, lure politicians uh, uh, into this. It's primarily about the community. And find a structure where there is a board, uh, uh, an elected board uh, uh, or group representative as part of the CAP 284 and 287 uh, that would normally uh, articulate this. They represent the community. And uh, by talking to them, then they can call an AGM and at least 60% of members in an AGM has to endorse their idea. Uh, conservancy is also a land use policy, uh, just like how people are settling, uh, making grazing areas, and whatever other economic uh, 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 sectors uh, they are adopting into uh, their land use. Conservancy for conservation is also another. They just create, uh, they decide on an area and they agree uh, on the tenants, like people have to move out from a certain uh, area. And then uh, once it is agreed upon, um, we will have a conservancy can be initiated. When we have the likes of NRT coming, uh, giving logistic, uh, logistic support, then uh, it normally enhances this process of setting conservancy uh, uh, to be very easy. And uh, that's how communities uh, comes up uh, with conservancies. And when we have a land chain where there's a group land, they have the title D, it's not NRT, which has the title D. Uh, but the challenges of trust land like Isiolo, for the case of Isiolo, uh, we have not these uh, uh, you know, uh, community lands. Everything is trust land mm -hmm. or public community land. There's been uh, those problems because when the community will want to set up a conservancy somewhere, they'll be meddling by politicians who may have uh, a different mind. And uh, that is why you see when they want to set up a conservancy or doing a lease, uh, they have to consult the county government and uh, uh, there could be uh, 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 such kind of challenges. Uh, when you try to compare a conservancy in a group land and a conservancy in a trust land, you'll normally find those interests are so many bottlenecks because they have to involve people beyond their localities and uh, the political class. Uh, other challenges that we face in uh, running of our day-to-day -day, uh, cons uh, consumers' operations is uh, uh, things like uh, encroachment, cattle encroachment. We do a lot of uh, sensitization when it comes to grazing matters, rangeland management, uh, and we also have dry season and wet season grazing blocks where we, allow, we do systematic uh, grazing and opening up of blocks inside the cons uh, conservancy buffer zones. But sometimes during prolonged drought, uh, you might find uh, cattle going even in the core areas of the conservancy, even in the high privacy areas uh, of investors. And it kills the product of uh, exclusivity that uh, our investors uh, are trying to sell. Uh, because sometimes you find this conservancy might not have, so it may not be teeming with water, but the investors would sell uh, you know, that pristine uh, landscape. Uh, but when you find uh, cattle here, people moving with motorbike here, some settlements inside the conservancy, then it kills uh, that product. And, you know, uh, clients pay so much for that. So these are some of the challenges uh, we might be facing. Uh, uh, also, drought uh, is another one. Um, during drought, you, you find uh, wildlife are dying, uh, even livestock have nothing to do, they move away. They, it, it kills uh, the, pro as not, the, the game drive uh, aspect uh, and stuff like that. Uh, also, uh, low season, during low season, you might find the... Mr. Tsong. 
Mr. Yeah, Tommy, uh, okay. we, we're losing you. Yeah. Yeah, uh, I, I think your connection is uh, on and off. Uh, thank you so much for that. Uh, we have uh, less than five minutes. So uh, I'd, I'd like us to take uh, the final two questions uh, from, from Mr. Letiwa and from Daniel uh, Letoye. But uh, as we do this, uh, Nicole, we're really admiring uh, the scenic. <laughs> yeah, the scenes behind you. Are we able to see any animal uh, before we leave? You know, as here living under uh, skyscrapers in Nairobi. Yeah, what are we able to see uh, before we take the last two questions? Any any animal moving about? I can I can <laughs> see some uh, some reticulated giraffe from a distance. C can you uh, point to it as I ask the question from Mr. Letiwa? And uh, people are able to see that. Awesome, that is beautiful. It's under that big rock. I don't know how to zoom it here. Yeah. It's under the dumps up rock. They are, they are, they are enjoying themselves around uh, the dumps up rock. Yeah. So this is the beautiful Kalama Hill. Mm. Okay. As well as the camp. Mm -hmm. Uh -huh. Small office. So I'm enjoying the beauty of uh, the conservancy here. I, I can tell it's it's really so cool. We hope to visit uh, one day. <laughs> and uh, as we conclude, Mr. Daniel, uh, climate change uh, have been asked twice. Uh, does is it affecting the way you operate at NRT and in these conservancies? And Mr. Tom Letiwa. Uh, if you could have the last word, I, I think Abjata has asked uh, similar questions that, like the ones we had asked, but I think there is a, an important one he's asking on Ill illegal wildlife trade. You know, like the people who poach, uh, do we have records? Uh, do we have uh, statistics that you can share with us? And are these people, he's asking, why if we've engaged the communities, uh, do we still have illegal wildlife trade and poaching? And are these people uh, from these communities or are they outsiders? Uh, if we could finish with that, uh, Mr. Daniel Letoye, please. Uh, climate change. Are we seeing the signs? Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Kiundu. Um, yeah, a quick one on climate change. But before I come to that, I just want to add something where, where Tom was asking, or somebody was asking also on, on, on the formation of the, the conservancy about the question of land mass and wildlife uh, population. Uh, for you to form a conservancy or establish a conservancy, there is a difference between a conservancy, a sanctuary, and a wildlife farm. So if you look at the Wildlife Act, that uh, defines very well what you need, depending on the amount of land that you have. So, um, yeah, you know, you cannot define, you cannot give a landmass that you must have this size. But if you look at the Wildlife Act, it can give you. Also on the, on the, on the wildlife population, you can start a conservancy with any wildlife that you have. It doesn't have a specific number. But uh, maybe uh, our life that are endangered, or depending on the conservation status, this can also be um, established as a conservancy. And I just want to refer you to the Wildlife Act 2013. Uh, you can get the details of this. And there is also the guidelines that are actually hosted by KWCA, that is the Kenya Wildlife Conservancy Association, on how to establish as a conserv mm -hmm. uh, conservancy. So outside that, on climate change, mm -hmm. yes, uh, climate change is affecting the conservancies. And it's definitely affecting our, our work. And that is actually one of the things we are trying to address as the NRP and the conservancies. And one way of, we are doing, or the, one of the, uh, the mitigation measures that we are trying to, to cope uh, or to, to apply are things like uh, plant grazing, where the communities are able to develop their grazing plan so that they can have pasture depending, uh, I mean, throughout the year. So they need to have to plan their grazing and also the use of their water resources so that uh, in case it rains, in case it doesn't rain, then they can be able to have their own reserves. Some few other conservancies are also engaging on, uh, on, 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 the, on the grass harvesting. You know, some are harvesting the seeds and they plant during the rainy season. Some are also still uh, <coughs> going the way of the hay as, as an adaptive uh, mechanism for climate change. Then uh, some, somebody was also asking about uh, the, the, you know, the case study, the success story. 
Uh, you know, conservancies, and Tom uh, has mentioned a lot on bursaries, uh, we have seen students uh, succeeding in their education, including myself, um, uh, up to master's, uh, PhD levels because of the scholarship from these conservancies. And also we have seen communities having grass because of the rangeland management or rangeland rehabilitation, land that has been completely bare and has been rehabilitated through the conservancy up to a level that they can host their livestock for about six months. Uh, we have also seen this uh, wildlife, uh, I mean, uh, livestock market, the sales where the communities are able to get money into their pocket because of the conservancy. Uh, women beadwork is a big thing. And I just want also to share that uh, what uh, all these experiences that we are sharing, they are not just happening in Northern Kenya, uh, but uh, the conservancies in, in, in across the country. So the beadwork, you can actually come across women who are entirely their livelihood or their life day-to-day -day operation of the family, household depend on, on, on beadwork that is happening through the conservancy. So, um, yeah, I think I've, I've tried to yeah. answer a number of questions. Thank yes, you so thank much. you so much. Yeah, thank you so much. We are on the top of the two hours. Uh, Mr. Tom, if you could do this under one minute and then we'll close it, uh, we'd be very grateful. Answer Abjatas Khalif, if you on mute, sir. Uh, thank you. I'm saying thank you for the question. Uh, in conservancy, we, we record uh, everything that happens in day-to-day -day basis. And any illegal killing of a wild animal is normally documented in uh, what we call the conservancy database. We call it conservancy management monitoring system in which all the NRT conservancies have, have a database. So this database forms the basis for any information that you need, whether it's the population of a particular species in a conservancy, you'll be able to get. So this information is available. Also for for critical species like elephants, when it dies, this information is shared within by, with, with, by conservancies with the Kenya Wildlife Service and is put in what we call the, the uh, uh, there is a database, we call it Mike Monitoring of Illegal Killing of Elephants, which is done country. And this database is actually put inside there. So when we, uh, for the second question, which was asked whether this poaching or this killing of animals is done by locals or by foreigners. It's done by both. Because for somebody else to come and kill an animal in your land, there must be a collaboration between the locals and the outsiders. So locals mainly you are the ones who will kill, but it's sold. They, when the ivory, when they get the ivory, it's sold to foreigners. So basically it's done by both the locals and those people from outside. Okay. Uh, thank you so much, uh, gentlemen and uh, lady. Uh, Nicole, we're very grateful that you have given us your time and your knowledge and, um, and even a view of um, that beautiful place. Um, we also envy us. I would like to come and visit our beautiful country when uh, we are able to travel again. And uh, thank you uh, for the information about community conservancies. I'm happy and I'm sure our colleagues, uh, mostly the people who joined us today, uh, media practitioners, uh, they've been able to, uh, to understand this concept. And uh, I know they'll have so many questions. Uh, if you look at the questions, uh, we have not answered some. I will ask that I forward to you. And if you're able to answer, please, I'll share with them. And then they're also asking for your contacts and presentations. Can we share with them? Yeah, your email addresses and uh, your presentations. Are we in agreement? Yes. Yeah, yeah, that's that's fine. Uh, you can yeah. share. I can see a number of them asking our contacts, so it's fine. You yes. can share our contacts uh, with them, yeah. and they can be able to ask us. So no problem. We'll yes, as we do that, uh, we uh, we've been recording uh, this uh, show, and what we do, we share the recording later with all the presentations. Uh, now that we have you, go ahead. And also any other resources, uh, you know, like the figures, uh, 
or, or anything else you, you you think that can help us, if you could email that to me, and then I'll forward to the to the journalists, and that would really be uh, good. Uh, and uh, again, thank you so much. We we'll, we'll bring it to a close here. And uh, this uh, webinar, as I said, uh, was uh, in partnership with the NRT and Internews Health Journalism Network uh, for the. Uh, media uh, for the reporters here, you can go to our website, earthjournalism.net, while we make this uh, recording available and there are many other resources that you can get there. You can also become you know, a member uh, and join to other journalists from across the globe uh, who you know, uh, benefit and who you also learn from at Internews Earth Journalism Network. Uh, thank you so much, uh, gentlemen, mm -hmm. uh, lady, and everyone who has joined us today uh, from wherever you are. Uh, for taking time to be with us. Uh, do have a uh, good afternoon, uh, good, up, good morning, uh, if you're in another time zone. God bless. Thank you. Thank yeah. you, Q. Thank you. Good Thank you. Everyone. Bye. 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 Bye.